2023. The chair recognizes the gentlewoman from Illinois, Ms. Miller, for 30 minutes. I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days in which to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous material on the topic of this special order. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Tonight, I am incredibly privileged to join the Patriots at Concerned Women for America for the third year in a row by recognizing April as Faith Month. It's a time when we can set aside our differences and talk about the most important aspect of our lives, our faith. Since our founding in America, we have believed that God governs in the affairs of men. And actually, every day here in Congress, we acknowledge God by opening Congress with daily prayer. It was my faith in God that first inspired me to run for public office. As a Christian, my faith is at the heart of everything I do. Before any major decision and during moments of conflict, I ask for God's guidance and wisdom to guide me in accordance with his will. For my husband, Chris, and I, our Christian faith was central to raising our seven children. Now they are making faith a central pillar for the upbringing of our 20 grandchildren. We also put our Christian faith first in running our family farm, seeking to honor God as stewards of the land and everything he has blessed us with. Faith was key to our nation's founding. In fact, the pilgrims came to the new world in search of religious freedom, making the voyage across the Atlantic to the shores of Massachusetts. The right to publicly express their faith was so important that they risked their very lives. And contrary to public opinion, our founders did not believe America should be an atheistic society that shuns God. Benjamin Franklin called for prayer at the Constitutional Convention when it seemed destined for failure. The con convention then proceeded smoothly, and a few weeks later, the delegates adopted the Constitution that endures to this day. John Adams believed that our republic could not function without faith. In fact, he said, our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. And Thomas Jefferson attended and promoted a church service in this very building every Sunday. Our founders never meant for faith to be separate from public life. Quite the opposite, they intended for faith to play a central role in our nation. In Matthew 17, 20, Jesus said, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. I believe faith is what is needed in this body today. We need faith to overcome our mountains of division so we can do what is right for our country and the American people. I'm humbled to share my faith on the House floor and recognize that this sacred right has been preserved by those who have selflessly laid down their lives for our freedom. I'm honored to share this special order with several other friends and colleagues in this body. Next, I would like to yield two minutes to my friend, Mr. Alderhalt from Alabama. Thank you. Um uh, Congresswoman Miller for organizing this and working with Concerned Women for America for making April uh, Faith Month. And uh, it is an honor to be a part of this to uh, recognize a country where we can recognize our faith. And uh, I, I know and understand and recognize the distinct opportunity that we have as Americans to worship freely, to come alongside each other with great respect, and also to respect uh, various viewpoints. But we are blessed to live in a country where we can worship freely. Um, it is a very important part of the fabric of, of the United States of America. When I have visitors that come to the United States Capitol, I like to take them into the rotunda. The rotunda, there is a, a painting that uh, is called The Embarkation of the Pilgrims. And in that painting, it depicts 
a pastor, as they are getting on board the deck of the Speedwell in 1620, gathering in prayer as they go toward uh, and look for a new nation where they can worship freely, which would ultimately become the United States of America. And I like that painting because it reminds us of the freedom that we have here in this country even today. Uh, tonight, there are about 11 pastors in Nicaragua that don't have that freedom. They're in prison for 12 to 15 years each because of their faith in the country of Nicaragua. But here in the United States, we don't have to worry about that. As a young boy uh, back in Alabama who recognized that uh, I had, uh, that I needed Christ in my own life and accepted Christ as my Savior, uh, I um, am re reminded that I have that freedom and I don't have to worry about going to prison or facing jail time merely because of my faith to, to follow Christ, which is something I, I try to do, as you say, Congresswoman, on a day-to-day on -day basis, even though, as you know, we all fall short of, of that standard. But in closing, I do want to thank my colleague from Illinois for uh, organizing this time and uh, for bringing us together and reminding us that this country was built not on mountains of money and not on great prosperity, but on the faith of so many people that came before us wanting to worship freely and to honor our God and maker. And with that, I yield back. Next, I'd like to yield uh, two minutes to Mrs. Harshbarger from Tennessee. And I just want to thank Diana for being uh, a co-chair of the Family Caucus. Uh, we know that two things made our country not only good but great, and that is faith and freedom yes. and family, yes. faith and family. And anyway, mm -hmm. Diana, you can have two. Thank you, Mary. You're a dear friend and a colleague. Mr. Speaker, our founding fathers believed that democracy and our system of government could only prosper in a Western society guided by Judeo-Christian values. I raised my son with these values, and he's raising his sons with the same set of values. And for nearly 30 years, I've instilled these same values to our youth as a Sunday school teacher. As we've all observed, America is at a social and political crossroads, which stems from a profound loss of traditional Judeo-Christian values that make up the foundation of our families and therefore our nation. Religious devotion among Americans is collapsing. More than a third of the country declined to attend religious services. Less than 75% of the country holds strong, solid religious beliefs. Is there any wonder we see the crime rates continue to surge and America's mental health crisis continue to worsen? The conclusion is simple. It's a direct effect of the erosion of our Christian values, and it started with taking prayer out of the schools. America needs spiritual guidance now more than ever. Christian values promote personal responsibility, compassion, and a sense of community. These are the essential pillars missing in today's society. And when these values are absent in a family or in a society, you will see a decline in morality that can be generational. We as leaders need to not only remind ourselves, but our colleagues and our constituents that restoring Judeo-Christian values that our country was founded upon offers a pathway for our country to heal. If our country or our families fail to embrace the principles that made our nation great, our nation risks further division and decline. That's why I'm proud to co-chair the Congressional Family Caucus, which seeks to restore the guiding Judeo-Christian values and principles that exemplify our nation's greatness by promoting God-driven and family-focused policies. It's time to reinstate the teachings of Jesus Christ and chart a course toward renewal, reconciliation, and revival for our great nation. And with that, I yield back. Next, I'd like to yield three minutes to my friend, uh, Congressman Andrew Clyde from Georgia. And I want to thank you, Andrew, for um, making it obvious that your faith is so important to you by being such a principled and courageous man and how you handle your opportunity here as a congressman. Thank you to my friend, Congresswoman Mary Miller, for leading this important special order and for being a leader in defending religious freedom. Mr. Speaker, I rise today in honor and celebration of Faith Month. During Faith Month, we rejoice in God's gift of salvation 
Thank our Lord and Savior for his many blessings and celebrate the everlasting power of prayer and his word. As is said in Matthew 5, 16, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. The Bible calls on us to proudly demonstrate our faith and boldly champion our Christian beliefs. As a believer, I'm thankful for this opportunity to celebrate our faith and our precious freedoms, especially at such a time as this, when it's critical for Americans to be grounded in faith. Our country is hurting, and Americans are crying out for strong, effective leadership. It's becoming harder to achieve the American dream. Communities are being overwhelmed by violent crime, dangerous drugs, and illegal aliens, and our unalienable rights are being chipped away by the very people responsible for safeguarding our Constitution. We need more leaders here in Washington who are rooted in faith, who put their trust in the Lord, and who use His Word as a guiding light through these challenges. Our founders not only knew the importance of Christianity in society, but proudly acknowledged and gave deference to our Creator in the foundation and core principles of our nation. They correctly declared that our liberties are not granted by the government, but by our Almighty God. This includes our most fundamental freedoms outlined in the First Amendment, which preserves our unalienable right to religious liberty. By safeguarding religious freedom and drawing the Lord into our government, our founding fathers were ensuring unity and prosperity for gen generations to come. As George Washington asserted in his farewell address, of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. I pray that we don't lose sight of those supports, especially as we work to save our country and protect our freedoms. Let us proudly join together to rejoice in and lead with our faith. And may others come to know salvation that only comes through faith in Jesus Christ. Let us continue finding strength and wisdom in God's word. And let us preserve and maintain our founders' religious principles. Because a government whose foundation is built on God and his word is a government that will have peace, prosperity, and liberty. Thank you. And I yield back to the gentlewoman from Illinois. The freedom to share our faith is not something we should take lightly. To preserve that right, we need to exercise it. Next, I'd like to yield two minutes to my friend, uh, Mr. Allen from Georgia. And I wanna thank you, Congressman Allen, for always taking opportunities to share your faith. Good. Well, I wanna thank you, uh, Congresswoman Miller, for giving me this opportunity in this time and for hosting tonight's uh, special order recognizing this week as Faith Week. I am deeply honored to stand here tonight to express my personal faith and all that God's word has meant to me in my life. As I uh, reflect on the timeless teachings of the Bible, I'm reminded of the d divine wisdom of Exodus. In those sacred passages, God established laws and governance to uphold justice and righteousness. I'm looking right now at the full face of Moses, looking down on this body, who led with unwavering faith and divine guidance. So too must we ensure that our actions align with the purpose of restraining evil and promoting good in our society. Above the flag is in God we trust. So that means we are without excuse in this body. During times of such division and uncertainty, the words of Mark 3, 24 resonate deeply within me, reminding us that a kingdom divided uh, against itself cannot stand. It is through our collective faith in drawing near to the word of God that we find the path to unity and truth and freedom. Joshua 1, 8 speaks uh, to the power of scripture in guiding our actions and, de and decisions. In fact, uh, his instructions to, uh, the God's instructions to Joshua in Joshua 1, 8 is one of the greatest promises in the Bible. He says, do not let this book of law depart from your lips. Be careful to do what it says. Meditate on it night and day, and you will be prosperous and successful. As we meditate upon God's words, we are promised prosperity and success like Abraham, whose faith was credited to him as righteousness. Trust in God's promises and live obediently by his word. Our lead house ministry is reading through the Change Your Life study Bible. 
Easter was especially meaningful this year as I was uh, reading at the, on that particular date uh, about the transfiguration of Jesus in Luke 9, 28 through 36. Now you have to understand there were three witnesses here. And uh, in, in this passage, which I'd like to uh, share with you, uh, Jesus took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto the mountain to pray. He was praying, and, and while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which, is about to, uh, bring to, uh, which was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. And they were afraid. As the men were leaving, Jesus, uh, Peter said to him, Master, if, if it is good for us to be here, let us uh, put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. Listen to him. Jesus also said in Luke, if you love me, you will obey my commands. During this special week, we uh, are let, let us seek God's blessing and protection as we navigate through the complexities of government and acknowledge this sovereignty over all things. Uh, during this special week, uh, we are aware of uh, uh, so many things uh, that, that are profound that impact our faith. Uh, one is hope, uh, guiding us through life's trials and triumphs, and it unites us in a bond stronger than an earthly tie. I hope those watching, watching will join me in reaffirming our commitment to worship the Lord and to draw strength and imp imp inspiration from his word. What was so meaningful at Easter was, was that here we had three eyewitnesses of the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. Earlier this year, uh, uh, or, or, uh, uh, Billy Graham was laid in honor in our capital. I have read many of his inaugural prayers as a reminder, and every week for the past 16 years, uh, I, you know, it resonated with me. And this prayer was given in 1969. And it's like Billy Graham was predicting the future. He said, our Father and our God, thou hast said, blessed is that nation whose God is the Lord. We recognize on this historic occasion that we are one nation under God. We thank thee for this torch of faith handed to us by our forefathers. May we never let it be extinguished. Thou alone has given us our prosperity, our freedom, and our power. This faith in God is our heritage and our foundation. Thou hast warned us in the scriptures, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? As George Washington reminded us in his farewell address, morality and faith are the pillars of our society. We confess these pillars of being eroded in an increasingly materialistic and permissive society. The whole world is watching to see if the faith of our fathers will stand the trials and tests of this hour. Too long we have neglected thy word and ignored thy laws. Does that sound familiar today? Too long we have tried to solve our own problems without reference to thee. Too long we have tried to live by bread alone. We have sown to the wind and are now reaping a whirlwind of crime, division, and rebellion. And now with the wages of our stand, sin staring us in the face, we remember thy words. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal our land. I also serve as the chairman of the Congressional Prayer Caucus. Uh, uh, I, and I, one, one thing is it's important to highlight uh, prayer and how it's played a vital role in strengthening the fabric of our society and the bond in this chamber. 
Uh, the Congressional Prayer Caucus is a bipartisan congressional uh, member caucus consisting of members from across the country who, who meet at first votes every week and it believe in the power of prayer. You can go to my website, allen.house.gov, and submit your prayer requests, and members of the prayer caucus will lift you up in prayer. May God bless uh, each of us abundantly during this faith week as we seek to, uh, to help others understand the faith uh, that we share and that we hold so dearly. And as we walk in this faith and righteousness, thank you and may God's grace be upon you and the peace of Jesus be with you and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Allen. And I can give testimony that he's very faithful to share the prayer requests with other members and, and we pray over them. Speaker, may I ask how much time we have left? Gentlewoman has eight minutes remaining. Okay, thank you. It's hard to constrain ourselves when we're talking about our faith and the impact that the faith of many Americans who've gone before us has had on our country and the world. And we know that faith without works is dead. And when you consider um, just the amount of missionaries that have been sent from our country into the world, it's very profound and it's something to really um, celebrate tonight. And now I'd like to yield two minutes to my good friend, Mr. Webster from Florida. And I, I just want to say that it's a real privilege to meet regularly with Mr. Webster and another other group um, to pray for our country on a weekly basis. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk um, about an important subject. This is a simple word, faith. It's defined in the scriptures as faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, for by it the elders received a good report. So it has substance. It has its evidence. It's touchable. It's feelable. It's not just something in the air. So it's a simple word, though. Then where does it come from? Faith comes by hearing hearing by the Word of God. It comes from the, from the Bible. That's where we get faith from. We hear it, we read it, we study it, we understand it, and then we practice it. And by doing so, our faith grows. Then, faith also, though, it's important to note, we can't please God without faith. A lot of people want to please God in all kinds of ways, but the Scripture says, it's impossible to please him. Impossible without faith. So without faith, it's possible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Then also, though, with all that, it adds up to really a simple life. A life that just takes a simple word, turns it into real faith, believes it, lives it out. So it, the scripture says, thou hast hold me by my right hand. That's when we find that first initial faith, faith in Christ, faith that he's our Lord, faith that he's our savior, faith that he is the God he said he was. Then thou shalt not only do they take me by the right hand, but thou shalt guide me with thy counsel. Where's his counsel? It's in the Bible. So we study the Bible. We know it. We live a life. And eventually that life comes to an end. And the scripture says, then thou shalt take me to glory. That's heaven. A simple life. A life that just says God holds us by our hand. He leads us by his counsel and afterwards takes us to glory, to heaven. What a great thing. It's a simple word. It's a simple life. And it's a simple faith. Yield back. Thank you. Next, I'd like to yield two minutes to Mr. Good from Virginia. Thank you, Congressman Miller, for hosting this 
uh, important initiative tonight. You know, after ratifying the Constitution in 1789, the founders had the wisdom to compose and pass the Bill of Rights in 1791 to further protect Americans from a potentially oppressive federal government. They believed that we needed to codify into law to further protect Americans, they believed that we needed to codify into law, in fact, into the highest law of the land, the enumeration of certain rights, God-given rights, for which it was spe the specific responsibility of the federal government to ensure and to protect. The Bill of Rights did not begin with the right to free speech, to a free press, to assemble, to petition our government, to keep and bear arms, or even the right to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures. No, the first enshrined and protected right was the freedom of religion, the free exercise thereof, and the freedom from a government-established religion. You see, the founders understood that the most important, most precious, most fundamental right is the right to freely believe or not to believe, to worship or not to worship, to exercise or practice our faith or not to do so. Throughout human history and across every corner of the globe, mankind has exercised the God-created yearning to reconcile with his creator. Mankind has wrestled with the purpose of life and the question of the afterlife. Sadly and unfortunately, those questions cannot be asked freely and those rights cannot be practiced freely in many parts of the world today. But we are so blessed to live in a country where we still have that freedom today, and it is critical that we endeavor to ensure that unobstructed freedom endures for those who come behind us. The good news is that those questions about the purpose of life, the reality of eternal life, have been answered in the Bible, God's inspired, inerrant, infallible written word. The Bible is the good news of Jesus Christ, the death and resurrection of the Savior, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. 2,000 years after his sacrificial death on a cross, an undisputed historical fact, this son of a carpenter remains the most prominent figure in human history. He, how did someone who had no formal education, never traveled more than a few miles from his home, never held any kind of public office, had no material wealth, and was executed at the young age of 33, how did he literally change the world with billions of followers ever since, including around the world today? This despite many efforts to prohibit the distri distribution of the Bible and the free exercise of the Christian faith around the globe and throughout history. The answer is that he was and is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. That is why his disciples, his inner circle of chosen followers who witnessed his crucifixion, died in testimony of having also witnessed his resurrection. They gave everything to spread the gospel, the good news of their Savior Jesus Christ, so that others might know the salvation they had experienced. I am eternally grateful that others shared that faith with me as when I was just a young child of nine years old, I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. It is my Christian faith that shapes every area of my life, my purpose, my joy, my peace, and my confidence in my eternal destination. Thank you again, Congressman Miller, for hosting this special order, recognizing the importance of our faith, and I yield back. Thank you. And now I'd like to yield two minutes to Representative Grothman from Wisconsin. Thank you. Um, as has been said earlier tonight, John Adams said, our country is built for a moral and religious people and totally unfit for any other kind. We are right now in danger in this country. We know that the government cannot establish a religion, but we live in a time in which our government is outright hostile to religion in general and to Christianity in particular. We live under a welfare state in which we are openly hostile, or certainly financially hostile, to a traditional family. During the 1960s, Kate Millay, famous uh, uh, feminist, said that one of her goals is to destroy the American family, and the feminists had a lot of influence in the 1960s. We have Black Lives Matter desiring to destroy the, the so-called Western prescribed nuclear family and countless members of Congress stand with people like that. The Marxists, of course, and many people are apparently following Marx, were hostile to the family. We live at a time in which our sex ed class is partly paid for by the federal government when the governor of Florida tries to delay these classes with graphic sex ed until a person's 10 years old, it should have been 17 or 18 anyway, he's under attack. We have the FBI monitoring Christian or religious parents who object to this anti-Christianity. 
we are using our material wealth to lean on other countries around the world, Hungary in particular, African countries, hostile to the practice of religion in those countries. It is important that Congress in general, or Congress in particular, and Americans in general, stand up and protect the Christian, value, the Christian values, the religious values that our country was founded under, and stand up and prevent our current government from the hostility, not just neutrality, hostility to the moral and religious people that our country was founded to protect. Thank you. I want to thank my friends and colleagues for participating in this year's special order on Faith Month. None of us knows what tomorrow holds, but we can rest assured that our sovereign God is watching over our nation. America has endured nearly 250 years, and I believe the secret to our greatness has been our faith in God. Through vicious wars, economic hardships, and conflicts that threaten to rip us apart, God has graciously preserved the United States of America as a shining city on a hill. Second Chronicles 714 says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. If we truly humble ourselves, pray, repent, and turn from our sins, I believe that God will hear our prayers, forgive us, and heal our deeply divided land. We are never beyond the, the reach of his grace. Thank you, and Mr. Speaker, I yield back. Does the gentlewoman from Illinois have a motion? Mr. Speaker, I move that the House do now adjourn. The question is on the motion to adjourn. Those in favor say aye. aye.